If you have your Bibles, we'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, we're going to begin in verse 1. 2 Corinthians 4 will be in verse 1. And so the definition of a philosopher is anyone who seeks wisdom or enlightenment. So anyone who is seeking to gain wisdom or be enlightened on anything can be seen as a philosopher. And I just want you to know that I live with one of the world's preeminent, the greatest, the highest philosophers, and he is a three-year-old boy named Silas. Here is an example of a conversation that may or may not have happened last night. So um, it goes like this, Silas, let's go brush your teeth. It's time for bed, buddy. And he looks at me and says, why? I said, because well, we always brush our teeth before bed. Why? I said, because if we don't brush our teeth, we get food in them and it's gross and we need to brush them. Why? Well, if we don't brush them, they're going to fall out. Why? I'm not a dentist, buddy. I don't know. Let's go brush your teeth. Why? And then I finally follow up with, because I said so. Let's go brush teeth, right? Um, Two weeks ago, we welcomed our third child, Ruby Grace, into the world, and Silas got to go meet his baby sister at the hospital. He was so excited. He was running up and down the halls, pumping his fist, telling anyone, I'm going to meet my baby sister. I'm going to meet my baby sister. So he goes in the room. He meets her. He gets to hold her, gives her a big kiss, turns to his mom and says, I'm going to put my bed right there. And we said, oh, buddy, that's not really how this works. That's against the rules. And he says, why? So I just, we're exhausted at that point. So I just take him out to the nurse's station. I'm like, we'll let them handle it. He walks up to the nurse's station and says, I'm Silas. This is my daddy. I'm going to sleep in that room with my baby sister. And that poor nurse said, oh, buddy, that's probably not a good idea. And he said, why? Why is a great question. Why do we do anything is a great question. Why do we gather together on Sundays? Why do we send you out scattered into community groups? Why do we give? Why do we go? Why do we serve? Why do we do all of these things? So this morning we're beginning a new series called Our Part. Our Part. The good news of Jesus has been preached to everyone who believes in him. And the same good news that was preached to us is meant to be preached to other people. And God calls us all as individuals to be part of the proclamation, the sharing of that good news with others. But he's also called us together as a church to preach that good news. And so as we begin our series this morning, we're going to answer the question, why? Why do we do all of this? And we're going to cheat. I'm going to give you the answer up front, and then we're going to see it from the text. So our big idea this morning is we have a ministry to fulfill so we do not lose heart. We're going to read verse 1 of chapter 4. I'm going to pray, then we're going to dive in. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, thank you for the ministry you've given us by your mercy. Lord, it's a gift. It's a grace. Lord, I pray this morning that you'll stir our hearts to participate wholeheartedly in the ministry you've given us. Lord, speak to us this morning from your word. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. So verse 1 is going to anchor us in the text, but we're going to use use verses 2 through 15 to kind of shed light on verse 1. So we our first point is we have a ministry to fulfill. Paul begins verse 1 with the word therefore. And anytime we see the word therefore, we need to ask, what's it there for? What's happened up until this point to get us to verse 1? And so 2 Corinthians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. After he gets a bad report about the church from his buddy Titus. So Titus um, sends Paul this message as Paul's traveling through Macedonia that the church isn't doing so well. And so if you go back and read 1 Corinthians, which is the first letter Paul wrote, you kind of understand what's going on. Paul writes 1 Corinthians to correct them, and it's really intense. There's a, they're being corrected for two major things, sexual immorality immorality and idolatry and how the two are connected. And he's saying, hey, you can't do these things if you belong to Jesus. And believe it or not, they don't love being told that they're wrong. So they reject Paul. Okay, they reject Paul. They break their relationship with Paul, which may not seem like the biggest deal to us. Why does it matter that the Corinthian church 
have a good relationship with Paul. We're not saved by Paul. Paul didn't die on the cross for us. Why does this matter? Well, the problem is they're rejecting Paul in favor of these other guys who Paul calls the super apostles, okay? He's making fun of them. He's like, yeah, these Justice League Avenger apostles that you're following, like Batman with the Bible, like that's not who you're supposed to follow. You're supposed to follow me, not because I'm great, but because the messages were different. In Corinth, they really valued people who appeared successful, people who were wealthy and powerful. And they have Paul who's suffering. Paul's a typical church planner. He's poor, he's homeless sometimes, and he's always asking people for money. And so you got Paul, this church planner, and these super apostles who seem really successful. And so they're choosing to follow these guys because these guys are preaching a little bit of Jesus and they're twisting it for personal gain. And what's happening is the Corinthians are going, okay, are we going to suffer and be homeless like Paul? Are we going to listen to these guys and be rich and powerful and successful? And they're tempted to follow these guys, these super apostles. And the problem is they're not just rejecting Paul, they're rejecting his message. And they're tempted, they're, they're in danger of following a different gospel. So they're rejecting Paul in favor of a different message. So Paul, he writes 2 Corinthians to be reconciled to them. He wants their relationship to be back whole together. So why is this a big deal? Well, number, well, number one, because they're rejecting, him, they're rejecting Paul's message. Number two, because we have a gospel, the good news of God, which is a gospel of reconciliation. Our God has reconciled sinners to himself. So Paul said, hey, we have to be in good relationship because if we preach a gospel of reconciliation but fail to be reconciled to one another, we will fail in our ministry and our mission. And so Paul is answering a question throughout the whole book of 2 Corinthians, which is why should you listen to me? Why am I good enough for you to listen to me? Why am I competent? Why am I sufficient called to this ministry? And in chapter 3, verse 4, Paul answers. He says, such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Why is Paul sufficient? Why is he competent? Why is he good enough for this ministry? Because God's good enough for the ministry that he's given Paul. God in Paul is. God has made Paul sufficient. Friends, we've all been given a ministry. That's what we're going to see this morning. And I want to say this up front. God equips everyone that he calls. God in us is good enough to do the ministry he calls us to. And so let's dive in. So Paul says, therefore, having this ministry, he, he, be, he continues saying we have this ministry, a specific task by God. And what's Paul's ministry? To proclaim the good news, to preach the good news of a new covenant, a new way God has entered into relationship with his people. Chapter 3, Paul goes back over this new covenant. He says, Moses brought the law, which is kind of like an MRI or an x-ray. It can show you where you're broken, but it can't heal you. It can say you're a murderer, but it can't forgive you for your murder. He says, but Jesus came, and he brought, and with him, he's given us the good news that we get to preach that brings life. So Paul's ministry is to proclaim this good news. He proclaims this good news. Why does he proclaim it? Because it's a ministry of mercy. It's given to him because of the mercy of God. All ministry is by the mercy of God. So in 1 Timothy, Paul references his conversion story. Paul was Saul of Tarsus. He was killing Christians. He was participating in the murder, murder of them. And then God radically saves him. And in 1 Timothy, he calls himself the chief sinner. He's the number one sinner. He says, but he received mercy. In the Greek, it literally means God mercied him. God looked on Paul and pardoned him. He had mercy on him. Why? So he could display mercy. We receive mercy to display mercy. We all deserve to face the penalty of our sin. We all deserve to stand before God and have to give full account with no way out for everything we've done. But God, in his mercy, has made a way for us to stand before him and be seen as innocent. And the same mercy he gives us is the same mercy we're meant to proclaim. Paul was given mercy to display mercy. We're given mercy to display mercy. What does Paul's ministry have to do with us? You could read this and go, well, Kenneth, this is about Paul. This isn't, I don't see my name in there. 
if we've received the same mercy from God, we have the same mercy to proclaim. If we've received mercy, we've been given a ministry by the mercy of God. We're rebels who've become representatives, enemies who've become emissaries, adversaries who've become allies. We were once far off, but we've been brought near by the blood of Jesus. If you belong to him, you have been brought near. I don't want you to miss this. If God saved you, he's called you and brought you into the participation and the ministry of proclaiming the good news to others. God uses us as just a part. We play our part in the salvation of others through proclaiming Jesus. We've all been given specific ministries. Right? I don't live on your street. I don't work at your job. But when you are there, God has placed you there for this reason, to proclaim him. To proclaim him. We gather together as the church, and then we scatter as the church. We're just as much part of a local body God has put here to display his mercy when you're at home than when you're here. And I know some of you are like, Kenneth, you live at the church, basically. You live at the bottom of the parking lot. That's cheating. I get that. But it's still true. It's still true. What's God's plan to reach your city? You. Us. What's God's plan to reach Gaston County? Us. What's God's plan to reach the world? Us, the church. All ministry is God's work. We've been given it by his mercy, and we participate in his mercy. All ministry. So whether that ministry is going across the world to proclaim Jesus to people who don't know him or serving in Exodus kids, that's a way you play your part so people hear the gospel. Whether that's praying for your neighbors to know Jesus, or that's moving, you know, to a different part of our county, maybe West Gastonia, to help plant a church. That is your part. So how do we play our part? Paul helps us in verse 2. He says this, we have renounced disgraceful and underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Paul says we're not doing anything shady or sketchy with God's word. We're not twisting it for any reason, but by open statement of the truth. This is the plain truth that I've received from God. You can test it by your conscience before God, saying, I am telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. Why should you listen to me? Because this is the plain truth I've received from God. And Paul speaks of how the gospel is veiled in verse 3, because there's kind of this question. They're like, well, Paul, if your message is so simple and it's so obvious, how come everyone doesn't believe it? If you're a Christian, you've probably wondered that. This good news is so good. Why doesn't every single person believe it? Paul tells us why in verse 3. He says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. So he says, if our gospel is veiled, if it's covered, if it's hidden, it's covered by those who are perishing, why? In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Paul's really clear. He says, hey, we're not hiding anything. Our gospel isn't covered because of us or because we're twisting it or because we're making it too complicated. The gospel is hidden. It's blind people can't see it. Why? Because they're being blinded by the God of this world. Who's the God of this world? Satan. Satan. They're perishing. In the Greek, the, the, idea, the, the word perishing conveys this idea that they're dead in their sin and they're participating in their death. They're sinners by nature and by action. And one day they're going to stand before God and have to give account for everything they've done. And they have no hope of being declared innocent. They are perishing. Why? Because the God of this world wants to keep them blind. He wants to keep them blind. He has them blind in their sin. Because he wants to drag as many people with him to hell as he can. They're going to face, if they stay blind, they're going to face eternal death apart from God in hell forever. Forever. Satan wants this. And I know it's heavy. It's a heavy word. It's the truth. And Paul's saying, hey, we're preaching the truth. Why? Because the God of this world has blinded the eyes of unbelievers. But then he tells us what we can do about it, what our part is. In verse 5, he says this, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. 
with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who has said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I'm not coming to you proclaiming me, I'm proclaiming him, I'm proclaiming Jesus. But he doesn't just proclaim Jesus, he proclaims Jesus as Lord. He comes preaching Jesus Christ as Lord. In the first century, if you lived in the Roman Empire, you had to declare allegiance to Caesar. In Greek, it was Kaiser es Curios, Caesar is Lord. And what people had to do is you had to take a pinch of incense and throw it up and burn it at this altar to worship Caesar, both as your political leader and your God. You'd say, hey, he's part political leader, part God, and I have to worship him. Many Christians in the early church died because they said, hey, I'm not saying that because Caesar's not Lord. Jesus is Lord. So when Paul comes in saying, hey, Jesus Christ as Lord, that's what we're proclaiming. He's making a really, really strong statement. Jesus is Lord. He's the sovereign ruler of all things, of the universe. He created all things. He's in charge of all things. And he's God. He took on flesh and he came, this Jesus of Nazareth. That's the one. He's Lord. But, I, but he's also, he's this ruling, reigning king, God of the universe. But he's also the crucified and risen king of the universe. This Jesus came and he died on a Roman cross. He bore the penalty of the sins of everyone who, be, who would believe. And he died on a Roman cross and was buried. But you see what Paul says? He says, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. He doesn't say Jesus Christ was Lord and then he died. He is Lord. He died and he rose again, defeating death and hell for everyone who would believe in him. Paul's saying, this is what we proclaim. We proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord. What's the remedy to the blind, perishing unbelievers in our world? We proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord. We get to do that. We get to participate in that. Paul, throughout his life, he suffers a lot. And he sees it all worth it because he gets to participate in this ministry. We proclaim the good news of Jesus. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, isn't simply information. It's not advice. It's good news. Information would be me looking at my wife and saying, hey, dinner's really important to me. Good advice would be me telling her, hey, I'm getting kind of hungry. You should probably go cook dinner. Good news would be me opening the door and saying, the pizza is here. That's good news. It's here. It's here. And so God has saved us. As the song said, Jesus paid it all. He paid all of it. He paid all the penalty for sin, all the debt that we owe. And we get to play our part. We get to proclaim it. God has chosen to use us as a small part of saving others. He pays it all. We proclaim it all. On Tuesday nights, I cooked dinner at our house. So I grew up with two younger brothers. Um, I didn't grow up doing a lot of cooking. My mom did the vast majority of our cooking. And so most of the time, I think it's because she wanted us to just go outside and try not to kill each other so she could have a moment to herself. So she would cook dinner. Um, so I didn't really know how to do that. And so this last year, I decided I'm going to start cooking dinner. So every Tuesday night, Whitney gets to go. My wife, she gets to go do whatever she wants. And I, myself... Our four-year-old and our th my three-year-old, we cook dinner together, which I just want to say it out loud. Learning to cook with the four- and three-year-old helping you is like learning to run with cement blocks on your feet. It's very hard. Um, there's a lot of like, hey, don't pick your nose, go wash your hands. So, oh, it's, it's, it's a lot. But um, they get to play a really small part. They get to pour stuff, pour a little salt, a little flour, a little stir. They get to help. They get to play a part. But who's dinner dependent upon? It's upon me. And they get to play our part. Salvation is dependent upon God. But we get to play a small part. We get to play our part in proclaiming the good news of Jesus. Why? Because the light of the gospel is stronger than the darkness of Satan. Paul, in verse 6, he's referencing um, Genesis in the Greek, the Greek version of Genesis, which is called the Septuagint. Um, and what he's saying is he says, the God who said, let light shine out of darkness. When God said, let there be light, that's the same God that has shown in your hearts. He's shown in your hearts the light of the knowledge of the glory of Christ. He's shown that in your hearts. What's he saying? He's saying the God who created light, life, and everything has saved you. And he turns the lights on in people's hearts. 
He turns the lights on in our hearts when we hear the good news of Jesus and the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see him. Paul's saying, this is what God has done. This is what we do. We proclaim Jesus and he turns the lights on. Right? And then what happens? When we receive the good news of Jesus, we shine our light. Y'all remember? This little light of mine. Woo! I'm going to let it shine. Right? Y'all remember? Okay? And this is hide it under a bushel. No! It's like because it's going to cause a forest fire. Don't do that. Um, don't put it under a basket. But it's like we have a light to shine. We shine our light. We participate in the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel throughout the world. We do this in so many ways. But we are called, friends, to play our part. We have a part to play. We've been given a ministry by God's mercy, and we play our part. And we do this because the ministry is by his mercy, and it brings life. Our second point is pretty simple, is we do not lose heart. In verse 1, the end of verse 1, Paul says we have this ministry so we don't lose heart. We don't lose heart. There's lots of reasons we could lose heart. To lose heart means to be discouraged or to despair. There's lots of reasons we could give for why we could be discouraged. But instead of getting, getting into those, we're going to get into the two reasons Paul gives for why we should not lose heart. Number one, in verse 4, Paul tells us that people are perishing. Satan, the God of this world, has blinded the eyes of unbelievers, and they're going to perish in their sin with no hope of being forgiven. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord because God shines the light of salvation into people's hearts. I think most people, I'll just speak for myself, I have a hero complex, okay? I think most people do, but I know I do. So if I watch a movie... I'm not like an extra character in the background, right? If I watch a movie, I'm like practicing to fight Darth Vader. I'm training to beat Ivan Drago and in the Cold War. That's who I am. I'm the main guy when I'm watching a movie. I picture myself that way. And I remember growing up in history class, I would think about myself that way, and I would always think. I'd hear about these horrible atrocities people had committed. These things human beings did to other human beings, people created in the image of God, and they were terrible, they were evil, they were cruel, they were wicked, and I would think, if I was there, it would have been different. I would have stopped it. Friends, people are perishing right now, and we're here right now. It can be different. We get to play our part in the proclamation of the gospel. We get to play our part because people are perishing right now. Right now. And it can be different. It can be different. For some of you who don't know, um, I'm, next year I'm planting a church called Citizens Church in West Gastonia. There are a lot of reasons to lose heart. When you think about it, um, some of the brokenness that's in that part of our county, um, and just some really practical questions, right? Where's the money going to come from? Like, who's going to go with you? I had someone ask me one time, do you think anyone's going to show up on your first Sunday? What a great question. Like, hey, I'm not losing sleep over that. Don't, don't bring that up. But why, why would I do that? Not because I'm awesome, because I'm definitely not, but because people are perishing. And we've been given the good news to proclaim. And God's been abundantly faithful as we've set out on this journey. And so um, I prayed from the beginning that God would give me a second man to come be a, a pastor with me, a godly qualified man that um, would come and work. Um, in this work of planting a church, and God's provided. So we have a third pastoral resident, surprise. Um, his name's Spencer Fretwell, and he's going to come be the pastor of worship and community and whatever else we need to get done at Citizens Church. He's provided. God's provided. Why? Because he's given us a ministry by his mercy to proclaim the message of Jesus. I wrote most of this sermon sitting in the commons looking out the window at Highway 74, just watching people drive up and down, up and down the road. Just thinking how many of them are blind and perishing in their sin? How many of them are headed to hell for eternity? And it's a really heavy thought because eternity is big. It matters. But then I think, friends, we have the gospel. We have the good news to proclaim. And God's put you here. He's put us here. To do what? To proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and we get to do that. We get to participate in that. We do this. We don't lose heart. Why? Because people are perishing. We don't give up. We keep going. The second reason we don't lose heart is because there is a great end for us. 
there's a great end for us. We don't lose heart. We keep going. We keep pushing. Look with me at verse 7. Paul says, We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. He starts off, he says, we have this treasure. What's the treasure? The good news of Jesus, the light of the glory of Christ shown in our hearts. It's, it's where this treasure is stored in jars of clay. He's referring to human bodies. He's saying these broken, fragile clay jars. God's put the most valuable thing in the world in there. Then he keeps going in verse 8. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the, body, in, the, in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be also manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in your mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Paul saying, we're suffering, we're dying, but it's all worth it. Why? So life will be manifested in you. I'm going to give my life for this. We're going to give our lives for this. Dying men and dying women giving our lives to the proclamation of the gospel. And Paul's point here is that this isn't about me. This isn't about us. This isn't about Kenneth. It's not about whatever your name is. This isn't about Exodus Church. It's about him. He says in verse 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay to do what? To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. The word for surpassing in the Greek is the same word we get the English word hyperbole, which is to exaggerate something. He's saying God's strength is exaggerated. It's beyond anything we can imagine. And we're broken and fragile, but we get to point to what's impressive. God chooses the unimpressive to point to the impressive him. Exodus Church, God has chosen unimpressive us to point to the impressive one, Jesus. Paul describes his circumstances and he doesn't give up. He sees it all as worth it. Why? Because there's an end we're headed to. There's an end we're headed to. Look with me at verse 13. He says, Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Paul says, hey, we have the same Holy Spirit, and I just want you to know the reason I'm saying all of this is because I believed and so I spoke. He's quoting the psalmist here. He's saying, I believed something, and so I'm speaking it, right? We all live this way. Maybe you speak something really wise and powerful, like Popeye's has a better chicken sandwich than Chick-fil-A, or, you know, that Remember the Titans is the best sports movie of all time. Whatever it is, that's how we function. We speak things that we believe. Paul says, I'm doing that, but here's what I believe. And then he says, verse 14, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. He says, God raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus, he came, he died on a cross for the penalty of our sins. He was buried in the grave and he rose again. God raised him from the dead. He's going to raise us together with him and we're going to be in his presence, experience the goodness of him forever. Paul believed that because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, he was going to be in the presence of God, experiencing the goodness of God forever and ever and ever. Paul knows the truth. He knows it. He knows how it's going to end. But what does he do? He doesn't coast. He doesn't sit back. Look at verse 15. He says, For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Paul doesn't sit back. He runs harder and harder. Why? So grace can extend to more and more and more and more and more people so that God will be glorified and God will be thanked for who he is and what he's done for us. Paul says, I don't give up. I don't let up. I keep going. I keep going. Exodus Church, we don't let up. We keep going. When we lived in Mississippi, I used to run almost every day uh, I quit running because running's terrible. It's no fun. If you try to convince me that it's fun, you're wrong. Um, I could have a heart attack running on the pavement, or I could have a heart attack eating Cheetos on my couch. Heart attack either way. So um, I used to run. Our neighborhood was like a perfect mile loop. So here was my mindset as I ran. That first quarter mile, just, it's a breeze. I'm like looking around thinking like, why do people think this is hard? 
Like, when's the next Olympics? They need anybody on the team? Like, I'm, I'm their guy. Then I'd hit that second quarter mile, and I'd have the same thought every time. You could stop right now, man. Turn back around. That's a half mile. It's a good day. But I'd keep going, and then I'd hit that third quarter mile, and I would have the same thought every time. It sounded a little bit like this. <gasps> water, <gasps> water, water. But then I would hit the last quarter mile. It was on a, it's on a, on a slight hill, a decline, and I could see my house on the bottom. I'd see my house as I hit that, that last quarter mile. I could see the air conditioning and the couch and the water. And what happened? I ran as hard as I could to the end. I ran hard. Why? Because I knew the great end that I was headed to. Friends, we run hard. We can run hard right now because we're headed to the end. We know the great end, that we're going to be with Jesus forever. So we run hard. We proclaim the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord so that grace extends to more and more and more and more people. If you're here this morning and you don't know this Jesus, grace has been extended to you. The good news of Jesus has been extended to you. We'd love to talk to you about what it looks like to follow Jesus. You can find me or one of our pastors or probably anyone close to you. They'd love to talk to you about what it looks like to follow Jesus. We don't lose heart. We keep going. So every week in our series, we're going to talk about what is our part. What is our part in all of this? In this first week, it's going to feel like cheating, but our part is pretty simple. It's let's not lose heart. We have an amazing end, friends. Let's keep going. Let's keep pushing. There are plenty of reasons we could be discouraged, plenty of reasons we could lose heart, but let's be encouraged because we have the good news to proclaim and we're headed towards a great end. And perishing people need to hear the gospel from us. God's placed us here to do that. We don't lose heart. We keep gathering together and encouraging one another as a body. We scatter out into communities to preach and proclaim the gospel in our neighborhoods, our workplaces. We continue to give to Exodus Church so churches are planted and people go forth. Maybe someday we're going to say gospel goodbyes as people leave to plant churches in West Gastonia. And I'm hoping for the next hundred years all over the world from this church, people are planting churches and people are leaving. You're having to say sweet, sad gospel goodbyes because people are going, but let's not lose heart. Let's not lose heart. We've been given a ministry by God's mercy. Let's not lose heart. Let's not lose heart. In Gaston County, there's about 250,000 people, a quarter of a million people. A 2020 study said that less than 36% of them have anything close to church involvement. Um, so on a survey, someone said, do you go to church? 36% of people marked yes. Let's just say that that's true. Let's just say that all 36% of those people are genuine believers. They believe the good news of Jesus. That still means that over 160,000 people in our county are perishing. But friends, God's placed us here. He's put Exodus Church right here to proclaim the good news. And by his mercy, we've been given that good news. He's going to plant Citizens Church in West Gastonia, and we're going to proclaim that good news. He's put you in your neighborhoods and your workplaces to proclaim that good news. Friends, let's not lose heart. Let's run hard all the way to the end because God's given us this ministry. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. Thank you so much for the good news that we get to proclaim. We get to, you've chosen to allow us to participate in that. Lord, you've saved sinners who don't deserve your mercy and your grace, but you've chosen to show your mercy and grace to us. What a gift. Lord, we... We don't deserve it, but Lord, you poured out your blood for us to cover our sin. Lord, so that a veil wouldn't remain over our heart, but our hearts would be covered by your blood. and We'd be forgiven and free forever. Lord, thank you. Thank you. Lord, I pray that you will use us, encourage our hearts to go forward and proclaim your message, to proclaim that you're Lord. You're the risen, crucified Lord. Jesus, you're so good to us. Thank you. Lord, thank you for the truth that one day we're going to be with you in your presence forever. We ask all these things in your holy and precious name. Amen.